And with that, we move to the next session, which is on politics, policies, and animal rights. Yes, very interesting indeed. And the question is, where do they intersect? And for this very interesting session, we have with us as moderator, Paul Littlefair, who's the head of international for the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, RSPCA. A little bit about Paul. Paul graduated in Chinese studying and working in Asia before joining the RSPCA in 1998. He has collaborated with organizations across the region in many areas. The development of anti-cruelty law in China, inspectorate training in Japan, Taiwan and Hong Kong, farm animal welfare standards, welfare and etiquettes with several Asian National Laboratory Animal Sciences Associations and animal welfare education in a number of countries. Paul, a very warm welcome to you and I hand over the floor to you as moderator. Please go ahead. Thank you. Many thanks, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here again. Uh, to present this uh, 11th panel discussion. Um, as Sarah has mentioned, it's a very uh, interesting topic. It's probably one of the broadest topics that we have on the, on the conference agenda this time. Um, politics, policies and animal rights, where do they intersect? And we have a lineup of four uh, speakers today who are going to look at this particular question from slightly different angles. Uh, and I, I'm very happy to uh, introduce our first speaker, who I know. Uh, and I've known for a few years since we were working together on uh, trade policy issues in, in Europe particularly, and now more broadly. But this is uh, 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 Stephanie Guillain, uh, Steph, uh, Trade and Animal Welfare Programme Leader at Eurogroup for Animals. That's the umbrella organisation that represents uh, European member states and animal NGOs at the, at the sort of European level. And uh, Steph's uh, summary of her talk today uh, is, uh, why does trade policy matter to animals? Billions of animals are traded alive, used in production and testing procedures all around the world. Better understanding how international trade rules and trade policy impacts animal welfare is key to favor progress at the national, but also at the global level. Let me welcome Steph, thank you very much. Hi everyone, I would like first to thank the organizer of the Asia for Animals conference for giving me the opportunity to talk about this topic of trade policy and uh, why does it matter to animals. Eurogroup for Animals is a pan-European animal advocacy organization. We mostly lobby the European Union. At the moment we have 70 members, mostly based in the EU, but not only, also in other countries. And we've been working on trade for the past 20 years, I think, and more in more recently, we could intensify our work mm -hmm. thanks to the member you can see on the screen, and I'd like to thank them. So today we'll talk about why do international trade rules matter to animal welfare organization and why should we understand them? Why is it important for us to understand them well? And we touch also briefly upon, if we have time, the trade agreements and trade negotiations. Why is that something that animal welfare organizations should follow? So let's start with international trade rules. The rules of the World Trade Organization do matter to animals because they cover the trade in animals and animal products. And they define, for instance, how trade can and cannot be restricted or what kind of labeling schemes are acceptable. Why is that important to animal welfare organization working at local or regional level? Because sometimes we have campaigns to ban the import of a product, for instance, seal-based product, uh, foie gras, kangaroo-based product. And when we campaign for that, sometimes we get as an answer from the authorities that they cannot do it because of WTO rules. And if you don't understand those rules, then you cannot reply to the authorities. Same when you campaign to improve standards. Sometimes you might face the answer that, oh, it's very complicated because if we do not, we cannot impose those standards on imported goods because of the WTO, you know. So then if we improve standards locally, the producers will face a lack of level playing field. It would be a problem in terms of competition. So no, we can't do this. Same for imposing labeling schemes on imported goods. But is that correct? Can trade be restricted based on animal welfare? 
Is their interpretation of the WTO rules correct? I would tend to say no, and I will try to explain to you why. The general rules at the World Trade Organization is that you cannot discriminate between products that are deemed like, similar, whether they come from any different country. So you can't uh, discriminate between the same product coming from Brazil or coming from China, for instance, and you cannot discriminate between the same product that is imported from any country or that you produce locally. But then the question is, what is a like product? Let's take the case of an egg produced in a battery cage. I'm guessing that like me, you would consider that it's a totally different product than the one that is produced in a free range uh, production. But this debate is not actually settled at the WTO. This is a debate about likeness of the product. And the issue of what is called non-product related process and production methods, basically the method of production that are not visible in a product at the end, like for instance, animal welfare, it's not really settled yet that really that can define, um, that can be a basis for differentiation and thus for discrimination. But in the case law, uh, with you know, because of disputes between partners, you can see openness to this because basically it's recognized as one of the criteria in terms of whether two products are alike. Is there a competition between the two products? Would a consumer choose one over the other? And maybe gradually, and maybe it's already the case for eggs, for instance, uh, someone would not buy one egg for the other if the other is not available. And there you can say that probably the products are not the same. But at the moment, this debate is not yet really settled. So when we discuss about uh, wanting, for instance, to impose some criteria on imported goods or to restrict the trade in um, an, you know, an, an humanely produced product, for instance, foie gras or something else, caged eggs, for instance, we might have to rely on exceptions that are contained in the, in the WTO agreement. So what can we use them for animal welfare? There is no real mention of animal welfare in the WTO covered agreement, but in the disputes, in the case law about the dispute, there are important cases. The first one being the one on the seal ban that the EU established. The EU, when it was challenged about this interdiction of importing seal-based products, they decided to argue that they did this in order to protect the the public morals of the citizen. Public morals is one of the exceptions based on which you can restrict trade. They say that animal welfare concerns of their citizens was very important. They were shocked by the seal hunting and they had to restrict the trade to protect them. And this is the first time, because the EU won, that the WTO recognized that trade could be restricted based on animal welfare, linking animal welfare to public morals, to ethics. The other interesting case that I would like to mention is one uh, that is about labeling. The U.S. has a label for safe tuna, so tuna that when it is fish, there is no problem for the dolphin. And the criteria to get this label is different uh, depending on the place where, sorry, the place where the tuna comes from. Like in this area of the East Tropical Pacific, you have actually dolphins swimming above the tunas. And so basically some fishermen just sat on the dolphins to fish the tuna. And if you want to get the label and you're fishing in that specific area, you have to have an observer on board, which is not necessary for other places. And so Mexicans who are fishing there considered it a discrimination. But the US won in the end because the WTO considered that there were different risks to the welfare of the dolphins, not only their survival, because they discussed the stress, that the dolphins could get hurt. And so basically, they recognized that depending on animal welfare, you could have different criteria. Could be, there could be a discrimination. All these issues you can have in mind when you are campaigning and you are faced with the authorities telling you, we can't because of WTO rules. And I would like to briefly finish just with trade negotiations. You know, there are a lot of negotiations ongoing between countries, and we believe it's important for animal welfare organizations to follow them. Why? Because most often they have to cover animal product because of the WTO rules. They have to cover substantially all trade. And they can impact the market access, the rules on labeling, on audits. Sometimes, like with the EU, they can offer the opportunities to cooperate with partners on animal welfare. But the key issue is that basically, Unconditional trade liberalization can lead to the modification of trade flow. As I explained, you have to open further your market and your standards do not apply 
uh, to imported goods. So if you're a country with higher animal welfare standards, you can increase potentially the pressure on your producers because the rules are not going to be the same and you're going to have maybe a surge in very cheap imports of lower welfare products. So you need to look into that. You have to follow and try to check whether this can happen. And also, in general, unconditional trade liberalization has tend to foster intensification because mostly the big partners become are able to face the competition and to seize all the opportunities from those trade agreements. And so the, the animal sector has tended then to intensify and verti- like become more vertically integrated, etc. And so more so usually when the sector becomes more export oriented, it can be it usually leads to much more intensification. So I will stop here, but I will be happy to go further in detail to take some examples in the question if needed. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for that very that lightning speed <laughs> whisk through some very interesting developments uh, over the last few years uh, with uh, animal welfare and in respect of the WTO. Um, we'll come back to that, I'm sure, in the in the question and answer session at the end. I just remind the viewers who are with us live now, if you'd like to ask any questions, please use the panel on the left-hand side of your, your virtual uh, platform, if you like. And, uh, and we will collate all of those and, and put them to the panelists at the end of the session. Thank you. Um, I'll move on uh, to our second speaker now, um, Jessica Bridges, uh, I know uh, also has been uh, a very important figure in uh, supporting the uh, International Coalition for Animal Welfare and also at the new World Federation for Animals has just emerged this year. Um, Jessica is the policy director at the World Federation. Uh, and today she's going to talk about animal welfare and international policy uh, and her description of her presentation today. In order for animal welfare to be mainstreamed globally and across sectors, it's critical that it's adopted by international organisations. This presentation will provide an overview of various institutions that could hold the key to animal welfare being addressed at the global level. Thank you very much, Jessica. The floor is yours. Hi, I'm Jessica Bridgers, and I'm the Policy Director at the World Federation for Animals. And today I am looking forward to discussing with you how to put animals on the global policy agenda. So there's three key reasons why we would want to advocate for animals at the global level. Um, so firstly, it stimulates political will and ambition at the national level. So countries would be more likely to take up the issue of animal welfare. Uh, it has a mainstreaming effect across public and private sectors, so it encourages companies to do the same. And then it can also lead to better coherence of policy among countries, regions, and sectors, so helping us to close the gap between countries that have addressed animal welfare in their legal systems and those that have not. So just a quick overview of where we are um, in terms of having animals included at the international level. So prior to COVID-19, um, animals have been largely excluded. Uh, the main points where they are included is the animal welfare standards at the World Organization for Animal Health, which cover a variety of farmed animals, um, including and also slaughter, uh, transport of animals via air, uh, land, and sea. It also includes dog population control and animals in research but it's not something that is enforceable. So it's meant to be implemented by the OIE's 183 member countries, and, but it has that weakness of not being, in, being uh, enforceable. The Sustainable Development Agenda uh, addresses wildlife briefly in SDG 15. And the founding document of, for this uh, policy also mentions a world in which Humanity lives in harmony with nature and in which wildlife and all living species are protected. Um, so that's fairly positive for animals, but it's still pretty indirect. Uh, and then UN environment um, hasn't uh, passed any resolutions on animal welfare yet, um, but they have included animal welfare in their reports and they co-host each year uh, the African Animal Welfare Conference alongside African Network for Animal Welfare and the African Union. So after COVID-19, we really saw a proliferation of One Health in global policy documents. So addressing the interlinkages between humans, uh, human, animal, and environmental health. Um, but this is fairly limited. So what we'd really like to see is more um, emphasis on One Welfare. And unfortunately, we're just not, not there yet. Um, there's also been some co-option of One Health. So 
some institutions have claimed that uh, intensive farming systems are actually more biosecure and thus um, better for human health and also um, calls for the wildlife trade to be made safe instead of um, curbing the wildlife uh, trade. There's also been diplomatic concerns. So recently there was a document produced by UN Environment that mentioned the intimate relationship between humans, animals, and the environment. And one member state uh, requested that animals be removed because they felt that it predetermined the origin of the pandemic. So this can kind of give us a, a glimpse into what kind of discussions might be in the future in terms of animals in policy. So these are some of the major policy streams that um, relate to animals. So you can see here which animal issues they can relate to. And then it also shows by color coding um, how well organized the movement is um, in each stream. So up here in dark blue, these are organizations for which um, there's established uh, animal protection coalitions already working on. Um, here in the center, we know that there's quite a bit of animal advocacy going on at these institutions, but it's um, yet to be formally coordinated. And then down here in the lightest color of teal, we feel these are major gaps where there's um, isolated advocacy and not much coordination of efforts. So we think that the main ways that we can emphasize, or sorry, impact um, animal welfare on uh, the international policy level is to coordinate our advocacy to fill existing gaps in policy advocacy. So ensuring that where there are gaps, like we're shown on the past slide, um, we are making sure that those are filled and that we're also not duplicating our efforts. So if there's two organizations working in the same space, they're coordinating their efforts and um, working synergistically. And we also can work together as a movement to pool our expertise to develop common, strong and science-based arguments and we can also ensure diverse representation and voices from all regions of the world. So ensuring that we have um, more voices from the global south participating in international policy making will really strengthen our impact at the global level. And um, so these are some of the main policy streams that I think are important to watch. So UN Environment Program, I think, is one of the streams where animal welfare will be more tractable. Uh, UN Sustainable Development Agenda is going to be much more difficult and a much uh, longer term goal, but it has such far reaching implications for international policy um, that I think it's really critical that we be building um, the basis for animals to be included in the next uh, sustainable development paradigm, which would be agreed in 2030. And then international financial institutions, which uh, fund billions of dollars of uh, projects each year. So that includes the World Bank, um, the International Finance Corporation and regional development banks um, and trying to influence of the types of projects they fund and ensuring that animal well-being is taken into account, um, then we can really have a big impact for animal welfare. Um, and then some of the major upcoming events this year, so we have the Food Systems Summit in October, the Convention on Biological Diversity, where the global um, biodiversity framework for the next 10 years will be agreed and that will also be in October. And then we have the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, this should be in November. And then in early 2022, we have UN Env Environment Assembly 5, where there is the possibility for resolutions um, covering animal welfare. And then I just wanted to highlight the Animals Manifesto. So this is a document that includes policy asks on various issues to global institutions. It's gained broad support and Dr. Jane Goodall also wrote a forward for this. And it's been translated into five languages, including Chinese and Vietnamese, um, which you can access on the WFA website. And here's a bit.ly link for the English version. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at uh, jessicabridgers at WFA.org. And I'm looking forward to the questions. your your talk um, it's a very uh, good over, overview really of the different areas of advocacy where the gaps are uh, and I think that gives us a, a, a nice view if you like of 
uh, the animal welfare uh, global situation. So welcome questions towards the end of the session, I hope, uh, on that as well. Our third speaker is Dr. Wachara Pumpradit, uh, who's a medical doctor. He's a founder and executive director of Catalyst Company Limited. Uh, and he has a very neat uh, summary for his, his presentation today um, with a, a couple of bullet points, which I'll outline for you. So his, his presentation is titled, Policy and Regulation Are Only the Starting Point. Uh, and his five points he wants to cover uh, develop policy using community participatory approach, strengthen monitoring systems using community engagement and technological innovations, identify the best practices models, provide programmatic support, and always use inclusive multi-sectoral strategies. Uh, Dr. Pumpradit, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, an organizer, for inviting me to speak in this important conference. Um, policy is a crucial issue to discuss, especially in Asia, where animal rights movement is taking off and becomes stronger every day. Policies and regulation are just a starting point to create an enabling environment or ecosystem. But to ensure a true success in animal welfare and animal protection in countries where law enforcement is an issue, we have to do the following. One, we must develop policy using community participatory approach to obtain relevant policies and regulations. Two, we should focus on strengthening monitoring system using community engagement, technological innovations on top of government officials who are, as you know, extremely busy people. Uh, three, well, policies and regulations are a great thing, but they are by no means a true success they must be followed by a programmatic support for frontline workers, for private sectors, and communities at large. For example, in my experience in working on humane slaughter in Thailand, what I found strikingly is that people at the ground work are in dire need to be able to do the right things. Yeah, but they need support, they need capacity building. Regulations and policies alone cannot help them to do those right things they want to do. So rather than pointing out fingers to who should do what, we from multi-sectoral uh, uh, you know, areas should work together. And the last but not least is to use an inclusive strategy. You know, what I mean is that when we work for animal welfare and protection, we have to engage community, government, private sectors, and civil societies. Government in Asian countries must address that government alone cannot do it. This is a big movement. We all need to work together in one uh, you know, group or one committee. And at the international level, we need a global coordinating and financial mechanism to help direct, monitor, measure, and support country programs. May it be a new UN body, a global, financial mechanism similar to a success from Global Fund on HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria, where they have learned over almost 20 years in working using inclusive approach, engaging all sectors of society in pushing forward a development. So thank you again. I wish you friends and colleagues around the world a success in driving this important movement forward 
I welcome any suggestions or questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pompradid, um, for that interesting summary, uh, obviously drawing on some broad experience you have. Uh, I like the idea of bringing in lots of stakeholders and making sure that all our initiatives, all our advocacy are, are, in, uh, are, are done in an inclusive way. And finally, I turn to our last speaker of this session, uh, Dr. Sara Plato, uh, who's an Associate Professor of Animal Behaviour and Welfare at the College of Life Sciences in Jianghan University, which is in Wuhan, I believe, China. And Dr. Plato uh, is going to talk about um, animal rights and animal welfare in China, the debate around that. Uh, her introduction, I'll just read for you. Uh, so animal rights were introduced to China with the Chinese translation of Peter Singer's animal liberation book in the mid 1990s. And the concept was further explained in 1993 by a researcher of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences called Yang Tongjin um, in an article entitled uh, The Animal Rights Theory and the Ecocentric Argument that represented the first comprehensive review regarding the origin of animal rights in China. And since then, animal rights have attracted a lot of attention and controversy. Uh, some Chinese academics have underlined the need for the development of an animal rights argument in China, while others consider it, uh, and I quote, anti-humanity and a moral abduction. These arguments are the reason for the development of a new social activism about animal protection, animal welfare and rights that has sparked in China in recent years. Welcome, Dr. Plato. We look forward to your presentation. The concept of animal rights and animal welfare uh, were introduced into China mainland only during the early 1990s. And between the two arguments, uh, animal welfare was uh, the easiest one to be accepted both by Chinese society and also Chinese government, in particular because of the impact of animal welfare on the country economy. In fact, China, as most of the other developing countries, is strongly affected by the uh, like national economic development. And this can also be influenced by international trade standards that in a certain way and in some point can also like push toward changes uh, for animal protection. In fact, when China, for example, when China uh, entered in WTO in 2001, was kind of compelled to start to follow animal welfare standards for its livestock industry, in particular when most of the uh, Chinese animal products were banned from EU in 2002. In addition, when EU banned also the animal testing from cosmetic industry, China had to change its policy in order to avoid to be cut off from the international market. And in 2014 approved legislation where animal testing for all products made and sold in China was eliminated and in 2017 also added a list of uh, cosmetic imported into China that did not need animal testing. Uh, in 2019, Gansu province also approved uh, the first legislation that completely eliminated animal testing for all cosmetic made and sold in China and also imported into China. So in this case, we can see that, for example, uh, the economic pressure on the country by international trade standard can have also a very great influence of the changing of the policy toward animal exploitation. And in the case of cosmetic industry, we can say that this sector in China might be in the future the first one to completely eliminate animal exploitation. Uh, China does not have yet uh, like a specific legislation that prohibit animal cruelty and uh, and there are like and also uh, there are not like very uh, like clearly mention of uh, the avoidance of unnecessary pain to animal the only actually legislation that mention the, the avoidance of the unnecessary pain toward animal is the guideline of the humane treatment of a laboratory animal which is also con considered the first animal Animal welfare standard for laboratory animal approved in 2006. This legislation also is the only one that clearly like grant uh, like the um, like uh, the condition of sentient being for laboratory animals. 
Um, even though there is no specific legislation for animal cruelty, uh, pushing for this type of law is not new in China. In fact, since the last 10 years, many lawyers and representatives from MPC have tried to push legislation that prohibit animal cruelty animal cruelty and uh, and actually we had some changes for example last year 42 people were criminally charged uh, for the poaching of 100 sea alpaps in 2019 causing the death of 38 of, of these animals because of maltreatment uh, the poacher uh, were uh, like uh, punished with prison from 10 months to 14 years and with a fine of 5 million rmb even though the case is related to an endangered species is a precedent that actually can be used and expand for other animal cruelty cases. In fact, uh, we, can, uh, we can say that uh, sometimes uh, legislation for animal protection have started from uh, like, uh, criminally, like a criminal lawsuit to war uh, animal cruelty. And uh, in fact, uh, like uh, uh, granted uh, uh, animal cruelty case to stand in front of a court of law, it allow, the, uh, it allow to uh, see the animal as an entity that can be legally wronged. And in addition, the entity of the, of the, of the legal entity of the animal can also change and move from the, the one of an object. And uh, so animal cruelty actually could be a good uh, like way to push for policy changes of animal protection in uh, China. In fact, in 2019, China Daily published also a news that title, uh, Ministry sees uh, the need of uh, uh, anti-animal cruelty legislation. And the news stated that the Minister of Agriculture uh, was uh, like, uh, uh, fit, like seeing the need of a uh, legislation that prohibit animal cruelty, in particular after a series of critics uh, and uh, an escalation of discussion from the, from the society because of a series of uh, animal cruelty event. In fact, Chinese society, in particular the young generation, have changed a lot and supports animal welfare, animal rights, not only because they can like, uh, uh, support uh, a better treatment for animals, but because uh, this argument can also support uh, a modernization of the society and the country. Um, when we talk about legislation for animal protection in general, and especially in China, we need to consider that the government, when he had to approve one, is always squeezed between two forces. One is the global force that pushed war society and policy changes, and the other one is the local force that like, uh, is very uh, like attached to the nationalism, the tradition of certain type of economy, and in this case of exploitation of animals. In general, we can say that there is no country that has completely abolished the use of animal in medical research or the use of animal as food of source. These two industries are very powerful politically and economically. But what we can do is actually changing the exchange, the perspective of the public toward this industry. And the current pandemic has actually done a lot in matter of changing the perspective of the public toward this type of industry. In fact, I believe this is the right moment to hit the argument of the unnecessary, the unnecessary pollution of the factory farm uh, that flushed tons of antibiotic in the water, causing you know the uh, like strain like a, like a strain of bacteria to become resistant to common medicine, causing like thousands of death of human death and the unnecessary of for farming that still further support the spreading of zoonosis. So where animal welfare and rights and politics intersect? Well, there are two intersections, actually. One has been clearly underlined by this pandemic, and the intersection is where human health is at risk. And the other one is where the economy of the country is challenged by international trade. So I think that this is the right time not only to search for an intersection between among these entities but it's important to build one thank you <laughs> thank you very much dr plato um very neatly uh, in the last few sentences bringing 
us to some very uh, useful points for questions, I think. Um, I'm just checking our chat box to see if there's anything that's appeared in, in the questions list at the moment. If not, I have a few of my own, which I hope will start the ball rolling a little. I'm just checking with Sarah. I don't think so. Okay, good, right. Um, I've got a couple of things lined up anyway, which I think will, uh, will draw on some of the points that you've already made. Um, first of all, I just want to ask a general question about uh, the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, because I think it's one of those universal topics. It's a very broad topic. It's something that I know a lot of animal welfare organisations have been uh, focused on trying to uh, uh, work out the context, if you like, for animal welfare in, in this array of goals that we have for human development, essentially. So I just want to ask generally, um, we can go around the panel if you have a view on this, what, what are the prospects for uh, improving the standing of animal welfare in the delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals in, in UN member states. Anybody want to start? Shall I start with you, Jessica? Because, oh, sorry. Okay, Sarah, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, if, uh, if you want, I can give it like- uh, a, that's a, a, You had your hand up. I'm, okay. I'm going to go to Jessica immediately after you. <laughs> okay, um, first of all, I will say the SDG are great, but I found them uh, uh, very impractical especially uh, because uh, they fit one measure, like uh, one shoes. And uh, especially, I mean, uh, working in the animal welfare field and, uh, and going it across country, um, you know, animal welfare also in general, the standards that have been created are fantastic, but are created for Western countries. So when actually we want to put them, also the standard that actually are, you know, use it for uh, in the OIE. But when we try then to push them in, uh, in in a, in a different context, for example, in Asia, well, we found difficulties. For example, um, you know, we know an animal, okay, well, well animal welfare is like uh, independently from the country the animal lives, right? So, but, you know, the animal is like, let's say, is considering his genetic and is in, in the environment where he lives. So, for example, in uh, I make an example in China. In China, there are many type of breed, you know, like cattle and also so especially poultry that are, you know, like uh, the, uh, the one used in the Western countries. And uh, in China, they are like, they are raised using, let's say, techniques and standards that are not suitable for this type of breed. So the, the welfare in this case is like, uh, uh, you know, not in agreement. And on the other side, when in China, we are using uh, like uh, local breed, which are okay for, you know, the local environment, but they they are raised with like feeding and techniques that are coming from Western countries. So also in this case, we have like, a, you know, a contrast, like a, a not agreement. So in my opinion is the SDG are great, but uh, we should like, like, uh, cut them or better we should like look at them in a regional like with a regional eye so when we want to develop standards and and policy and and everything we should actually look the cultural differences like how animals are perceived by the locals how animals are raised the like uh, the techniques that are used in the country and uh, and what is more suitable so like make a uh, like the the shoes that fit for that foot, actually. So, <laughs> but, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Plato. Jessica, you've had a moment to think about it. I'm sure you've got lots of ideas at the top of your mind anyway. Sure, thanks. Um, so I think, yeah, so the SDGs are, are so important because they just get picked up kind of in every corner of the UN system and, and then kind of float outside of the system too. So I think whatever is included in them, you know, it ends up becoming an important issue. So unfortunately, um, you know, the SDGs are set in stone for the next decade um, until 2030. But I think the interconnections between the, 
what's covered in the SDGs, like food security, health, um, protection of terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, sustainable consumption and production. They intersect in so many different ways with animal welfare across almost any type of animal welfare issue. Um, so I think over the next few years, we really have the opportunity to make those conversations with policymakers at that level um, more frequent and help uh, them see those intersections a bit more clearly. And I think uh, the pandemic in some ways definitely helps that conversation along. And I think by doing that, then we set ourselves up to hopefully have animal welfare covered in the next um, development paradigm. So, yeah, I think. Thank you. Um, Steph, would you like to say something? Yes, yes, thanks. And I completely agree with Jessica. It's a I just wanted to add that it's also a tool that's a lot used uh, at local, national, European level. And so for us, that's why it became very important, although SDGs, of course, do not cover animal welfare, as we mentioned. For us, it's referred all the time in many policy documents. It's at least there is a, you know, an idea that anything that we're doing, at least at European level at the moment, should contribute to the SDGs. So for us, it was very important to frame animal welfare in that context to avoid also trade-offs, because as Jessica rightly said, there's a lot of discussion about One Health and about certain systems that would be better for One Health, but honestly, that are terrible for animal welfare. So for us, the idea was also that um, when uh, global powers like the EU or the big regions, China, India, are discussing how they're going to solve certain issues that they don't do a trade off that's negative to animals. I don't know exactly where we are going, uh, whether the movement, because it's very great we have now a World Federation for Animals. I don't know whether the movement is going to want to push, you know, maybe an extra SDGs or it's also interesting to imagine targets within all SDGs connected to animal welfare because animal welfare connects to so, so many of them very, very strongly. So I, I think it's an important tool to consider because you can't avoid it in the political arena but indeed you need to frame it at least in trade policy that's how we did it sort of explaining how by working on animal welfare and trade you can work on SDGs but yes you need to go around the problem that there is no animal welfare in SDGs. Thank you. Um, yeah. Dr. Popper, would you like to add something? Yeah sure Paul that's a very important question about is DG in terms of relation to our work on animal welfare. I think uh, to me, SDG, just like a, a country policy is a regulation, is there as a goal for everyone to talk about it. But what we need now, and I think this is a high time that we need an actual body on a financial mechanism or operational mechanism and organization that manages, take the SDG goals and take into an effect, right? In my talk, I reference Global Fund. You know, I had the experience working with Global Fund for HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria for 20 years. Before Global Fund was born, it was very fragmented program implementation to actually uh, drive to end HIV infection. But since Global Fund was on board, then all the effort was actually streamlined and becomes comprehensive. You now, what I'm what I'm looking at is that there are two major drivers right now that we want to take advantage of as our animal organizations. One is um, COVID-19, and obviously this is if you believe in the theory, right? So this is COVID-19, which is zoonosis, so an infection that jumps from animals to human, and it actually wakes us, uh, the whole world up about, we need to do something different. We need to live our life different in a way to prevent the next pandemic, which is coming again, I'm sure, right? And then the second driver would be an environmental impact that I think uh, Sara has been talking about the AMR or antimicrobial resistance. That's also a global crisis that not enough talks on AMR and that we should take advantage of AMR and zoonosis to push for this body to be set up. I'm looking at one day that this uh, global financial mechanism would actually ask for a proposal for country. If China wants to uh, submit a proposal as a country as China with maybe 150 organizations in China addressing every aspects of animal welfare to meet that SDG goal or to meet One Health initiative, for instance. And then you know, each country would come up with an inclusive multi-sectoral application. And then this international body sitting at maybe Geneva, uh, looking at how the country progresses in terms of animal welfare 
and you know, do analysis and then track the progress. So that way we both have the country to compete for good applications to do the good work for animal welfare. And also we want to promote an inclusiveness inside the country that governments and NGOs and then also private sector must work together. That's a problem I faced in, 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 in my work. I'm starting the work on human slaughter for, for only six months, right? But after conversation with Thai governments, uh, to me, I feel like they feel, oh, we have a regulations. We have a policies already, a job is done. It's a checklist mentality, right? So, I mean, these are good people, but you know, they don't look at how do we engage the whole society into an effort and actually gain an impact. So we need a certain mechanism internationally and then drive the local collaborations, again, though measures the impact and the progress of each country in terms of animal welfare in relation to SDG goals. So that's my idea. Thank you. That's that's great. And I, um, I like the way you've drawn on your obvious, obvious experience in human medicine as well, because I think that's an interesting, obviously, the One Health Initiative and the One Welfare Initiative that's come along more recently are really key frameworks, if you like, contexts for the work that we're trying to do. There's a panel of questions I need to zip through. So <laughs> I'm just going to uh, ask them very quickly, maybe just a line or two from each person on these ones. Um, Daniel Turner asks, um, so should we call our work animal rights or animal welfare? Does a rights agenda automatically provoke a sense of negativity to the policymaker or does it not matter? Steph. I, I think that's a fair point. Uh, I'm, I represent a member-based organization and so we have both animal rights organization, I would say, and animal welfare. So we need to find this kind of equilibrium. And also I can still see that in, in the past years, you know, the agenda changed even for the animal welfare organization, looking more into transitioning towards more sustainable food systems with also a look at reduction. You know, it's a different angle than probably earlier. So I can see a general change in the movement, but still, at least in my field, in trade policy, definitely you need to keep your ideals. You need to have your goals and to know what you're looking for, but you also need to provide some steps that they can take. And if it's true, if you go straight away uh, towards like the end goal and you only want that, then probably you're going to create a sense of negativity. And I'm not going to say that animal rights is like the end game for everybody, but I would say that, yes, you have to go step by step and probably it's easiest to have a more uh, balanced approach. And I think Daniel was in the previous um, uh, session talking about having different uh, vision, different perspective when you try to advise someone. It's a bit like that. You need to be a bit more balanced while still keeping your objectives very high, I would say, not to lose track of what you want. Jessica. So, yeah, just to add to what Steph has said, since I, I feel, yeah, that I agree with pretty much everything there. Um, and also coming from a membership organization, which has members from a lot of different viewpoints, and we have to find that balance as well. Um, what I find, though, in terms of policies that animal welfare has the scientific under, you know, animal welfare science being a field that is somewhat recognized already, um, it, it's better accepted by policymakers um, because it has that academic, I guess, in terms of, you know, the science um, of animal welfare um, underpinning it. So, yeah, my, my feeling is that in the current moment, um, we have to keep our, ide our ideals, just like Steph said, but um, the appropriate terminology and policy um, spheres is animal welfare. Yeah. Yeah, so picking our language, depending on who we're talking to and where we think they might be in their minds, and we're obviously where, where a country is in its development as well. Uh, yes, Dr. Pumperdent, do you have something to add? Right. You know, my honest feeling is animal rights. But, you know, by working in Asia, as a lot of us know already, by to be effective in Asia, to advance your cause, is that you have to build relationship. So the concept you mentioned earlier, Paul, about one health, one welfare, and one planet, might actually serve our purpose uh, the best. Um, you know, I've used uh, health initiative, I've used environmental um, um, uh, goal as an initiative to open up, for, for instance, school lunch program much easier than I use animal welfare or animal right. 
you know, and then I think we, we also, that's a lesson for us as well, that we don't want to be a single issue advocate, right? We want to be as comprehensive as we are. And we look at this uh, carefully. Uh, all living beings are actually interconnected, right? So human, animals, and the environment. So we want to be comprehensive in the way we, we look, even though deep down inside, we want to pursue animal rights. So, so that would be my suggestion, especially in Asia. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Dr. Plato, you have anything else to add to that? Yes, uh, I, I agree with all of them. And as Jessica said, yes, animal welfare is more accepted because uh, of the like more uh, scientific uh, like uh, uh, base that it has. And also because, as I already said uh, in my talk, because it's the one that impact most uh, mostly the economy of, of a country, uh, even though animal right has uh, also scientific supports because uh, animal has like scientifically speaking has emotion as like uh, uh, like some of them also a theory like uh, um, like game theory mind. So a lot of things also uh, support animal rights and. From this part of the world in Asia, of course, it's a very sensitive topic. It's not impossible, as you know, it's been said, the very important things are the connection with people. And, and it's not impossible because, for example, in well, in the Western country and also in, in South America, we have, for example, Swiss and Germany and Ecuador that have incorporated animal rights and nature in the constitution. So it's not something impossible. Of course, uh, it needs let's say it's a walk, you know, it's a long walk for like different countries, shorter for others. So it depends on the circumstances. Thank you. I'm not going to ask everyone all the questions. I'm going to pick a few people. Steph, could you, could you have a go at this one? So how can grassroots level organizations get involved at the sort of policy influencing uh, activity that we've been talking about? They seem to be sort of a gap between, you know, what, what grassroots organizations can really do to, to support this kind of work at a, a higher level, multilateral level, maybe. I think that's also a question Jessica could reply, but I think that uh, grassroots organization can be very important in generating support at a more local and national level. And so my, my recommendations would be if you can be part of an umbrella at your regional level, like Asia for Animals, or, and then afterwards World Federation for Animals, you can really have, uh, you know, a lot of... Um, you, you, you can have a lot of impact, even as a grassroots organization. I take my case, I work on trade policy, and on trade policy, some decisions are made at national level within the EU, and then I can work also with more grassroots organizations that basically put pressure on their government if there are strong, there are strong grassroots organizations and are much more known by their governments than we are as an umbrella, and so they can have much more power by writing letters to their government, by generating, for instance, a petition, and then showing that citizens are supporting certain policy options. So there are ways, and I think grassroots organizations can learn a lot of how to do this by probably joining an umbrella, either at national level first and then regional, and learning from how, from how the others are doing it too. Great, thank you. Jessica, specific question about the WFA, about the Federation. So um, how is uh, the Federation connecting the work that's being done around the world to UN processes? Big question, short answer, please. <laughs> there's the mute button um so yeah so i think the main thing is that we are trying to um identify the the best opportunities for people to get involved and then kind of give them give our members the opportunity so that they can step in and take advantage and um of them and share the work that they're doing and their expertise so we kind of are trying to function um kind of more as a conduit to make those connections that I think, for example, when I first started getting involved in international policy, it's very daunting to kind of catch all the balls at the same time. So we're trying to catch them and kind of hand them over um, so that others can pick them up and run with them. Yeah. Thank you. I think what's coming through is a sense that, especially for grassroots organizations um, who don't have the resources, they don't have the people, they perhaps don't have the experience and knowledge either. Um, you have to work together. We have to work in groups and federations and, and alliances and coalitions coming together either for long term or for maybe uh, just for the purposes of doing one thing, but certainly working together is coming through. Um, 
Sarah, I've got a question for you about, particularly about China, uh, which is, uh, let me find it, there we go. So how does, how does the increased interest in plant-based diets in China also to relate to national modernization? And can you say a little bit more about ecological civilization? Uh, okay, um, there is a change. I don't know in numbers, but uh, there is an increase in the city of uh, vegan restaurants, for example. In China, there is uh, the Good Food Fund, which is an organization that uh, uh, from, you know, support uh, from an educational point of view, like uh, a more sustainable uh, food consumption and uh, including also, you know, uh, like vegan food, not only a better uh, uh, like livestock industry. So uh, there there are like uh, different organizations that uh, actually are uh, working uh, on uh, on this uh, on this uh, side. For example, also uh, CBCGDF, China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation. It's or uh, the, the, this organization also organized many like workshop and, and encounters with schools uh, and with communities to talk about uh, a more sustainable consumption. So there is a movement, uh, of course, uh, um, including the government. I mean, uh, every 10 years, uh, Chinese government try to introduce uh, uh, like uh, um, some guidelines uh, to, um, to guide okay, the population to reduce the consumption of meat because that is the point to reduce it because the way it actually is growing is not going to be sustainable anymore, including the fact that China does not have enough land to feed the animal. In fact, you know, they actually, the government has bought a lot of land outside China, uh, in South America, in US, in Australia, in Europe too, in order to feed the animal. So absolutely, also the government is starting to realize that uh, it's not anymore sustainable to keep going in this direction, but there is a strong need of, on reducing the meat consumption in the country. And therefore there is this constant uh, emerging of, uh, of a workshop and organization that are like going to like in this di direction. Thank you, Sarah. I've got Thank a question you. for, for Wachara. I think this taps into your experience quite well. Um, question, policy design and policy implementation are two different things altogether. What's the mantra, if any, for syncing the same successfully, for putting policy design and policy implementation uh, successfully into practice? Any idea? <laughs> yeah, so not an easy uh, <laughs> question to answer, but I think we need to find a tailor-made strategy specific of that country to, to, to actually implement the policy effectively. And each country I'm sure has a different experience. So maybe you can work with OIE uh, at the regional level for them to actually pressure the governments to do that. But I think eventually, and that really is your prior questions about grassroots movement as well, how should we position ourselves is that all of this game, the power lies in consumer pocket. So I think eventually we all need to actually build a strong relationship with consumers, both individual consumers and then also institutional or corporate consumers, because they are the one who actually controls the game. Uh, they are the one who actually can pressure the government for certain policies or certain policy implementation as well. For instance, I've been working with Ministry of Agriculture in Thailand for the past one year, and they themselves even said so because they actually got pressure from all sides, from uh, private sectors, from international body, from each government changing policies from the society. But they come out and say that the most important factor for them to be able to uh, come up with the re relevant policies or implementations would be a consumer demand. So eventually, even though it's not easy, we need to uh, stimulate the right consumer demand. We need to be on the same side with consumers and pressure for, for, for humane products, for instance. And a lot of good news coming up, like in Thailand, I never thought that vegan movement is gonna take place so quick, right? I started the plant-based school lunch program only within a year. Initially, we started out with two schools, we expanding to 15 more schools. And then we actually approached the Ministry of Education 
And uh, obviously we use health reasons and environmental reasons as our leading uh, reasons to do the program. But then we try to touch on animal welfare and they're very well accepted and they said it's been wrong how we treat animal and they really wanna work with us in expanding because deep down inside they feel that animals should not be suffered this much for our food. So I think there are good consumers out there, but we need to remove certain socialized process that make us forget what we are do doing, what we are causing so much suffering around us. So, so my short answer, my summary answer would be consumer demand. Thank you very much. And you're right on time as well. This is excellent. I've got one last thought from an audience member, Donna, who says that she, I think, I believe it's she, prefers to use the term animal advocate rather than activist. So I think that's an interesting word. And of course, it comes back to the question that we had earlier around, you know, the language that we use when we're interfacing, when we're dealing with different sorts of audiences as well. And I know the word activist is not a word I use myself, but because I think it, it, it can, <laughs> it's a word that we may use together, but actually when we're looking outwards, perhaps it's not the best, best form of language. Others are using language like lobbyist. Thank you, Steph, for that. A lobbyist for animals. Yeah, that can work sometimes uh, in countries where lobbying is a, is a tradition, uh, but not in others, maybe. <laughs> Thank you so much for our wonderful panellists. We've touched on lots and lots of things in uh, less than an hour or so. So I'm really uh, appreciative and grateful to you all for the time you've taken to make your presentations very sharp to the point and also to answer these rather tricky questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Paul. You've been fantastic as always. and. Uh... Again, uh, lots of compliments to you for this fantastic moderation of this uh, session and to our fantastic speakers, uh, Stephanie, Jessica, Sarah, uh, Dr. Vachara. I think some great inputs there. And it's a very tricky um, question, actually, because uh, it's, you know, where do uh, politics, policies, animal rights interact and the various terminologies that come with it, animal advocacy, animal rights, animal care, animal welfare. Uh, so some very uh, powerful statements made today and some great experiences shared. So once again, thank you, Paul, and thank you to all our esteemed speakers. And uh, do stay with us if you can for the rest of the session. Uh, sessions rather would be great and have a great um, time ahead stay healthy stay safe and with this we enter a quick break we will return at 11 40 that's 1140 ist that's indian standard time and in the meantime you can please visit our exhibitors uh, compassion in world farming eurogroup for animals Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, Plant-Based Consulting China, pro Veg Grants Program, and the World Federation for Animals who are all actually eagerly waiting to receive you and also use the networking lounge. That's a great opportunity to network with all other participants who are attending this conference. So see you all at 1140 IST. Till then, take care and also further on, take care.